not exactly hidden. The first thing that hits Koga is the five different songs with wildly different instruments. It's all in modern cinder and all relating to a single person. The Hatch Day Girl is the subject of all five songs. He blinks a bit as he scans the obnoxiously gilded and traced area. He holds back a low whistle at the sheer extravagance on display. Has the entire room been dipped in gold and draped in silk? The savory smell of food being cooked on the spot draws his attention to a large buffet area with a huge circular table. In the middle of this table is a gap where a small troop of chefs rush around to prepare dish after dish after dish. Nothing is waiting under heat lamps. Everything is being crafted on the spot for any guest who asks. That one of the chefs is a liedress with clear Apuk ancestry, who's got an entire section of the buffet to her 12 selves, really hints at how exotic this has to be. Hanging from every wall are almost lifelike banners showing a single Apuk girl at numerous stages of her life, and always dressed so well past the nines that it can only be described as being dressed to the nine thousands. Central above everything is what looks like an egg that's been gilded with fucking axiom ride of all things and is raised above the entire open hall and held in place with little gravity generators in the wall. It slowly rotates, revealing that the hatch day girl wasn't hatched naturally. The egg was flawlessly carved open in a smooth pattern. That has to be the apuk equivalent of a C-section. Feeling a bit overwhelmed? Uthtir asks and Koga scoffs, a little flabbergasted at all this waste. A tiny fraction of this could found an entire community. Koga notes before amending mentally that if done sorcerously, then a bent tritite could also found an entire community. Which is much the point. Now come, let's greet the Hatch Day girl, Uthtir remarks. I understand that the point but I thought in Apu culture that understating something was a sign of confidence. This is an understatement, Uthtir says, and Koga stops as he tries to process it for a moment. Uthtir pauses and glances back at him to remind him to catch up. If this gilding is the understatement, then exactly how wealthy are our hosts? The Psalm Duchy has long had innumerable business deals and powerful trade agreements. There are even a few in my own family. It's why our Hatch Day girl, Alara Psalm, is my distant cousin. Several generations back, an agreement was brokered between the Tier Barony and the Psalm Duchy. It was tied in with a son of the Psalm Duchy being married into the line, our Hatch Day girl's little brother. I see. Is there a reason that in all my looking into Alara Psalm, I could only find information on what she's done with her mother? Simple. She's the favored, spoiled, rotten firstborn, the heiress to a woman that's over a thousand years old and showing no sign of having so much as a case of the sniffles. Uth Tear notes as they head towards a line of guests offering their gifts, tributes to the birthday girl. The many banners and statues, including a pair that seem to be made of diamonds and grown into that shape. They take place behind a battle princess in a pastel blue gown whose gift is clearly a wrapped-up sword of some kind. No doubt it's going to be more gilding than useful metal, which is what makes Koga wonder about Uth Tyr's own little offering. It's a piece of artwork. Metal crafting with warfire is considered fairly high art. My Aunt Vessel Tyr has been refining her skill over the past 60 years, She's just starting to break into the market, and it's considered rather hard to get a piece from her at this point. Uth Tyr notes, and Koga nods. Practical to get, and fits in well with this. Koga notes as he glances around to the musician who's shifting to another song in the glory of Alara Psalm. Now, imagine the fact that the Psalm Duchy is not the wealthiest or the most powerful on Serbo. Uthtir notes and Koga gives out a low whistle. Refreshments, sir and madam? A waitress asks. The metak is smartly dressed and fluttering as she holds up a large tray with numerous drinks labeled. Thank you, Koga says as he takes a simple glass of water. 
Oh, going for the expensive stuff, sir? The waitress asks. What? Koga asks before sniffing the crystal glass. It smells like water. What is this? It's Galligan water. Ice melt from the Galligan Comet. Uth Tear notes as she takes what looks like a flute of wine. But it's just water, Koga says slowly. Why would Comet Ice be a hard-to-get resource in a society that casually goes from world to world on a day-to-day -day basis? Water from a comet that was worshipped in the past. It's technically sacred. Uth Tear explains and Koga puts down the holy water right where he got it from and then grabs a flute of wine to match Uth Tears. Thank you for your time, madam, Koga says to the waitress who flies off with a bit of a giggle. Holy water for a drink? Sweet Kami. How indulgent. Welcome to the party, Uth Tear says with an impish grin. So do you think that the cacophony of songs will change anytime soon? Koga asks. It's not so bad, Uth Tear says as they move up the line a little. Perhaps not to those who ignore these things by reflex. I've unfortunately trained myself to pay a great deal of attention to my ears. Koga notes with a wry expression on his face. That would be annoying now, wouldn't it? Now, manners up, we're nearly there. Uthtir tells him and he nods as the line moves once more. True to the many wall portraits and tapestries, the birthday girl has a heart-shaped face and either has flawless complexion or an extremely skilled hand at makeup or an outright makeup artist in employ. The shimmering silk she wears is pearly white and shimmers in every color available with tiny pearls sewn into every hem. If her golden hair was any more artistically arranged, it would be an actual art piece and not a near abstract sculpture of golden beauty with gemstones woven into it. She is clearly regarding them both. And for a moment, there's a flicker of something other than the haughty and proud acceptance of the tribute being paid to her. It's gone in less than a heartbeat. Ah, Baroness Uth Tear and Guest, thank you so very much for joining me on this most wonderful day. It is a wonderful day, is it not? Uth Tear asks before presenting her still wrapped gift. I do hope my contribution to it makes it that much more wonderful. I'm sure it will. Now, whom is our guest? An older Apuk in a shimmering purple gown, feather boa and opera gloves that seem to be made of diamonds asks, sauntering over. Purple is very much this Apuk's color as her hair is dyed purple and flows behind her. Her every step has bounce and she bends down to kiss Alara Sam on the cheek. Well, who are you to join my dearest daughter's celebration? Daiki of the Koga clan. I am one of the founders of a new generation of sorcerers. The knowledge of my family is being added to the might of the dark forest. Couple that, with a touch of discipline and the more aggressive past, can be built upon for a more benevolent future. I see. And what happened to your horns and tail? Has some new offshoot of the Apuk come to be without my noticing? The Duchess Psalm asks delicately. Well, yes and no. I am a human, an alien sorcerer. However, one of my kind has found romance with a battle princess and their children are already showing the best of both worlds. Really? So that Vernon Shea was in fact not some terribly harmed child who became a sorcerer after losing his horns and tail. If he ever lost horns and a tail, then it was at conception Milady. He's human, as am I, Koga says. And the proper pronunciation is Vernon Shea. He uses a somewhat different naming convention to the Apuk. I see. Enjoy the party and try not to let any primitive manners grunge up the gilding. This is my little girl's special day after all, Duchess Psalm says slowly as she gives Koga the stink eye. I know my manners, ma'am. You need not worry, Koga assures her. My upbringing held good manners and dignity in very high esteem. I'm sure, Duchess Psalm states. You do bring the most interesting of guests, Baroness Uth Tear. I do hope you and this is a man, is it not? Yes, my guest is a man. 
My apologies, it's hard to tell at times with new races. Still, I do hope you and your date enjoy yourselves. An impoverished baronet such as yourself does struggle to truly enjoy the finer things in life, do you not? It is a struggle to indulge as you do my duchess. Now, by your leave, I think Koga and I have taken up far too much of your precious time already. Indeed you have. Do enjoy the party. It is rare for those of such minor means to enjoy the day in a proper manner. So what better cause is there than the celebration of my precious little hatchling? Duchess Psalm gushes over her daughter and then waves them both off. Well, I'm going to struggle to find the words for that, Koga remarks. He's not, but he's not sure he should say those words in a public place. I'm sure. What do you say we get ourselves a mild snack and see if we can't find a place in the party where there's a little more comfort to be found? She asks as they walk out over the golden floor. Every tile is a piece of artwork and it's all under a pane of flawlessly clear glass to prevent a careless step from breaking someone's ankle. Koga also can't help but note that if he were the more lecherous type, he could probably get a good look up someone's dress with just a bit of finagling. The distinctive double-clapping sound of his two-toothed getta gives him a bit more sense of balance to the cacophony of the music, conversation, and the sounds of the party in general. If the damn musicians could just stick to singing one song, even if they did it as a round, then he would be having a much easier time of this. Not enjoying yourself? Uthtir asks him, and he shakes his head. I'm afraid not. Although I can certainly appreciate the need for backup to a mess like this. It's like drowning in a sea of opulence, Koga notes. This isn't opulent, though, Uthtir says with a downright devious smile. No. This is a very subdued, incredibly modest party. I'm not certain as to the standards on Earth, but they must be through the floor if you're overwhelmed by this. She explains and he stares at her for a moment. Just, just how much wealth is there? I'm not certain how to put it in your terms, but I imagine several hundred orders of magnitude more than you've ever seen or have seen yet. As I said, this party is modest. Compared to some other psalm parties I've been to this one is an outright gesture of sheer humility. Koga lets out a low whistle at the thought of that as he tries to wrap his head around it. On duty chefs, diamond artwork, gold panel floors with artistic renditions in every tile, personalized songs, woven silk banners everywhere. This was a humble party. Wow. Just wow. Earth's first multi-trillionaire will be a pauper in rags next to the high class of the galaxy. Koga vaguely wonders just how well Admiral Cistern is doing before his mind turns to the other, more prosperous soldiers. The boys on the tiger who took a whole world, or Jerry and his increasingly large and wealthy Bridger clan, how would they stack up? Probably pretty high as one side had an entire planet and the other was selling extremely high-end products like water in a drought. Hello, hello, and hello. I am Chef Venron Many Minds. How may I serve you today? The Lydra chef asks them as they arrive at the banquet table. Koga? Uthtir asks, and he glances up and down and recognizes little of it. I'll take the chef's recommendation. You're the professional here, madam. If you don't know what's good to eat, who does? One deluxe spiced platter for our cruel space-born omnivore. And what can I tempt you with, milady? Chef Venron asks, startling Koga a little. She instantly knew he was human. She likely studies cuisine to an extreme extent, and when humans showed up, she got a good dose of culture and cooking. The kimono is his giveaway. A more apuk-friendly copy of his platter, please. Of course, Venron says as her many bodies get to work in a flurry. It will be but a few moments to get everything finished. True to her word, less than a minute later, both of them are presented with platters that are not only full of artfully arranged foods, but have tiny repulsors attached to the bottom so they float in the air, no table needed. They both quickly thank the woman and get out of the way for the other guests.